Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to take your seats, we have our final presentation of the conference. Just a couple of admin bits. Can I please remind you about your delegate feedback forms? We really do appreciate it. And suggestions. Um, it's too late to suggest where we go next. <laughs> uh, you should see in your conference booklet that the next conference, uh, which is our 40th, uh, in, as said earlier, is in March at the Leicester Marriott Hotel. So Sue Thornton Grimes, who's been helping today, and Anna Morehouse, the wizard at Bookings, uh, are organising that. Before that, if you're missing the Guild members, of course we have the National Glass Centre and um, we have our seminar up there on trade and industry, um, which Rod Claiborne is our seminar lead, um, so that is good. Uh, is there anything, any other miscellaneous brief announcements? Yeah, 8th of September. <laughs> The next Yorkshire Regional Meeting uh, is on the 8th of September uh, at Linton, just near Weatherby. Anybody who's signed up for a lift, the um, notice is downstairs in reception. Can you sort of stand by that and that you can be ticked off where the, the drivers pick you up, if that's okay? Right. Uh, thank you for the... I'm going to say some thank yous at the end, but... Um, thank you for the, any help whatsoever. Right, um, last but not least is what they always say, and I think that is exceptionally uh, appropriate for today, um, for both the topic and um, uh, of the British Library. Um, I hope you all appreciate there is only one other real outpost of the British Library, uh, other than London, and that is of course in Yorkshire, and this fits <laughs> not. <laughs> Where else would they put it? Uh, that's not really the reason that they say, but I'm sure Ben will give you a little bit of background into that. Uh, again, you've got a write-up in the conference booklet, uh, and I'm, you know, we, you can take visits, and we should be going again uh, as on a tour, and it's a fascinating place. So I won't wait. Uh, I'll just introduce Ben Sanderson. Uh, as you can see there, Head of Press and Communications at the British Library. And we welcome you very much. Thank you. Hello there, everyone. Um, I, as Jackie mentioned, I'm uh, Ben Sanderson, Head of Press and Communications um, at the British Library. Um, unusually, um, for a Head of Press at a national organisation, Rather than being based in London, um, I'm actually based up in Boston Spa myself. Um, so talking about the site and uh, sharing what the uh, 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 reading room at Boston Spa in particular um, can offer people is something that's quite close to my heart. Um, in terms of the British Library being a national institution, we do have a, um, a press team to help promote the various different activities that we do, the various different services that we provide. Uh, I've got a couple of press officers, uh, we also have a filming officer, we get lots and lots of requests to uh, film at the British Library. Um, most recently the new series of Alan Partridge uh, filmed an episode uh, down at St Pancras, so that, that, that will be one to look forward to uh, when, that, when that airs, hopefully later in the summer. Um, we also had a bit of filming at Boston Spa um, just last week, the um, uh, new film with Kira Knightley, uh, Official Secrets, which is filming at a variety of different locations in Yorkshire. Um, they, they filmed a brief sequence um, at our site. Uh, I'm not, not allowed to really say too much about it, except that uh, Boston Spa's a bit of a dead ringer for GCHQ. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, 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 that again will be quite, quite, quite fun to see that in sort of probably about 18 months' time when the film's uh, ready. So the press office sort of works as part of the library's larger sort of corporate affairs team, so that includes um, strategy, public policy, we, we work closely with our marketing teams as well, promoting what the library does. Um, one of the other things that I'm very much involved with as well is uh, our social media uh, activity and also policy as well, um, which is quite an interesting area um, and it's a fantastic way for us to um, sort of spread the word about the library's collections and also sort of engage with the wider public. Um, because we've got lots of members of our um, curatorial staff 
who tweet or have a presence on social media, on blogs, things like that, it does make them very approachable. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. So I've been at the library for uh, about sort of uh, uh, 17, 18 years, um, which is a bit of a spring chicken in library terms. Uh, we've got many, many colleagues who have been, been at, at Boston Spa for quite a bit longer. Um, just to say a little bit about um, the library as an organisation. It's the UK National Library. Um, it occupies the two sites in London and Yorkshire. Um, and we've got 150 million items uh, spanning the entire range of written, recorded um, human heritage. Uh, the oldest items we have in our collections are Chinese oracle bones, which are 3,000 years old, right the way up to this morning's newspaper. Um, so it's, it's an absolutely full, comprehensive and continuing to grow collection. Um, and it belongs to all of us. Um, the great thing about the library is it's not a museum. You're not looking at things under glass. These are living, working collections that are resources that are to be used. Um, so on that basis, the um, reading rooms, of which we have 11 uh, at St Pancras uh, and one at Boston Spa, are a really key part of our uh, operation. We also do um, some exhibitions uh, um, uh, at St Pancras site. We've just closed one on Harry Potter, uh, 20 years of the, the boy wizard. Um, and we're going to be opening one at the end of uh, April on uh, Capt Captain Cook. It's uh, 250 years since the Endeavour set sail. Um, and so um, we're, we're basically going to be doing a fantastic exhibition of uh, charts, diaries, letters relating to his uh, historic voyages. And then we've got a big exhibition in the autumn about the Anglo-Saxons, which should be fantastic. If, if there's one fact that you take away from this about the British Library, it's that we collect a copy of every single thing published in the UK. So every book, magazine, newspaper, etc. There are six legal deposit libraries ourselves, the National Libraries of Wales um, and Scotland, uh, the Bodleian in Oxford, Cambridge University Library, and Trinity College Dublin, which even though Ireland's an independent uh, uh, country, we, uh, we, we still sort of reciprocally, reciprocally collect each other's um, uh, printed materials. All of those libraries have got the, the right to collect items. We're the one that has the, com the, the, the duty to comprehensively collect everything, which is the basis of our fantastic collection. There's an image there of the uh, uh, British Library at Boston Spa. Um, it's a 40-acre sort of site. Um, how, how many of you are familiar with Weatherby or Thorpe Arch? Could you see a show of hands? Yeah, so it's, it's basically on Thorpe Arch Trading Estate. Um, with regards to anyone else sort of travelling from further afield, it's only about five minutes' drive from the A1, so it's really quite, quite well connected in different ways. Um, it was originally a munitions um, factory during World War II, um, and some of the, you can't see them terribly well from, the, uh, from, from that photo, but the large concrete building in the centre of the picture, there's some sort of like lower buildings a little bit further behind, and there's some of the original um, armaments uh, factory buildings. So the library's evolved over a very long period. Um, it began as part of the um, British Museum, so the British Museum Library. Um, and lots of people, when they think of the British Library, they think of the round reading room, which is part of the British Museum. Um, we actually occupy um, a, a brand new building, or a fairly, fairly new building at any rate, at St Pancras um, in London. Um, the uh, site at Boston Spa was originally uh, known as the National Lending Library for Science and Technology, and for many years its kind of key function was um, uh, basically operating as a sort of a hub of the library's interlibrary lending network. Um, it was uh, uh, sort of established as a separate entity and brought together lots of different libraries and collections, gradually sort of amalgamated the, them together onto the two site. Uh, and a big, big part of that operation was moving into the St Pancras building in 1998. So we're celebrating 20 years of successful operation this year. Some of the sort of iconic highlights that we've got, um, Lindisfarne Gospels, Magna Carta, uh, Handel's Messiah, um, an absolutely incredible array of maps, illuminated manuscripts, um, and literary um, icons from Charles Dickens to the Brontes. Uh, um, to Virginia Woolf um, and uh, in our treasures gallery if you go down to London you'll find that we've got some Beatles manuscripts which are absolutely fantastic 
One of the things I'd like to talk about today, um, which is particularly sort of accessible at Boston Spa and which I think will be very much of interest to you in terms of your discipline, will be our newspaper collection. Um, it's, it's without doubt one of the greatest collections of newspapers in the world, um, partly because the British are such voracious consumers of and publishers of newspapers, um, partly because of that legal deposit um, uh, function. We've collected this material very, very comprehensively over a period of many, many years. Um, and partly as well because we've, we're starting to get it digitised, which is really important in terms of improving the access to it. Some of the earliest sort of uh, items that you can start to think about as being similar to newspapers um, date all the way back to the English Civil War, where you had the, uh, the Parliament and the Crown giving opposing accounts of different battles, different uh, 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 sort of developments as, as the Civil War was progressing. Um, and even though the newspaper industry has had lots and lots of trouble over, over the last few years, we're still receiving um, 1,200 titles um, through legal deposit uh, uh, on, on a daily or weekly basis. Um, so a huge amount of material physically, um, uh, as, 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 as well as in terms of collecting it title by title. Um, in terms of the scale of the collection, we've got about 750 million pages of newspapers, um, which is really quite colossal. The thing that's wonderful about newspapers, and any of you who work with newspapers on a regular basis, know that they're, unlike books, they're not an elite production by an elite. They are something that contains all of us. You know, everyone's family, everyone, you know, everyone's own life, in some ways, is, is documented and reflected in newspapers. So they're a fantastic resource for people, people stu stu studying family history, but historians and, and novelists in particular love them because they obviously give you a window into their particular world. Um, part of the reason that they came up to Boston Spa is because of their sheer fragility. For many years, um, we had the um, newspapers that stored at the uh, uh, National Newspaper Library at Collendale in North London, uh, which is not far from the um, uh, Police Training Academy at uh, Hendon, um, which was a fantastic building, um, and it was very well used. It had a, a very loyal sort of band of users, but it was not fantastic in terms of um, caring for the collections. It was an 80-year-old building. It didn't have uh, the climate controls that, that you were... Uh, that you would want for that kind of collection. Um, and certainly, I, um, uh, it, it was not fantastic in terms of sort of uh, fire safety as well. Um, obviously, for, for newspapers, one of the biggest threats to them existentially um, is the threat of fire. So newspapers being the kind of uh, material that they are, so very ephemeral, meant to be read once and then thrown away, um, they're not meant to last two or 300 years. So it's the kind of material that you really do need to keep it in stable circumstances if it's going to have any chance at all um, to survive. So over the last sort of decade or so, um, our current generation of British Library, um, curatorial and logistical and um, estates and collection care staff have all been working really, really hard on solving this problem um, for the long term. So the idea came to um, move the collection out of Collendale and up to a, a purpose-built building at Boston Spa, which is this, the newspaper storage building. Um, it's, it's quite a fantastic building because it's not often that you get a single building that contains an entire collection. And, and that's, that's this, effectively, 300 years of local, regional and national newspapers uh, from across the UK. Um, so if any place has got a claim to be the mind and memory of the nation, it's, it's possibly this one. Um, it's absolutely huge. Um, the, the, the picture doesn't quite accurately reflect it. You know, you really need a sort of person walking along the side to get the scale of the building, but it's 24 metres high. Um, and uh, if you see the interior there, that was before we actually loaded the newspapers up. Um, so an absolutely vast space. Um, it's got low oxygen inside. We pump nitrogen into it in order to displace the oxygen. So um, atmospheric oxygen is about 21%. In the newspaper building, it's, it's reduced down by a few, a few points, which is breathable, um, but you wouldn't want to spend more than a couple of hours in there. And if you tried to strike a match, the, ma the match wouldn't ignite. It, 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 there's not enough for, 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 for flames to actually ignite. Um, generally speaking, you don't get people inside there um, because we have automated cranes picking items off the shelves. Um, the next image gives a bit of an idea of the, um, 
scared of it. <laughs> so that's 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 quite a that tells quite a story. Um, basically, the newspapers are kept in what we call stacks. Uh, so you have sort of several volumes, sort of like that, on a on a tray. You put another tray on the top. You bind them with sort of the red straps that you can see there, and then you feed them into the system. Um, and they probably all owe more to warehouse. Uh, management technology than they, they do to sort of traditional librarianship. But since it opened in 2014, it's been visited by um, staff from libraries all over the world who are trying to solve the same sorts of problems um, as we've managed to do at Boston Spa. So as, as part of the newspaper programme, as well as sort of saving the physical um, sort of uh, 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 aspect of the newspapers, we also wanted to try and transform access to the content as well. So part of the programme was a, uh, a partnership that we entered into with um, Find My Past. Um, so effectively a sort of a commercial partnership um, through which we would be able to digitise um, large parts of the newspapers at their expense. They would get some sort of revenue um, from um, making it available on, on the web. And we get to keep the um, images of the newspapers and when the partnership comes to an end, will be free to do with, with those images what, what we choose. So it may well be that in a few years down the line we'll be able to provide free access to them on the web. As, as things stand at the moment, um, at both uh, St Pancras and Boston Spa, you've got free use of the British Newspaper Archive on site. Um, the great thing about digitisation is that it completely transforms um, the searchability of the newspapers. Obviously, if you're able to search for surnames, etc., um, that's going to allow you to achieve results that you never would have done in a lifetime, potentially, of searching through the microfilm or, or, or print originals um, at Collindale. Um, it eliminates the wear and tear, um, and lots of uh, volumes that have been decades ago, just, you know, they've, they've been considered too fragile to provide in the reading rooms. They might be too fragile to provide in the reading rooms, but you can justify digitising them once, and that obviously unlocks that content and makes it available to people potentially for the first time for decades. So, very, very ambitious programme, um, and um, there's more than 20 million pages um, currently available um, on, the, uh, on the Find My Past website, so it's a, it's a terrific resource. The other aspect of it is, as well, is that um, we very much wanted to um, get a lot more regional titles um, uh, available via the website. Obviously, newspapers like The Times and The Guardian have been digitised for many years, um, we didn't want to replicate that work. We wanted to expand you know, the, the sort of scope of material that was available online. As well as saving the newspapers, uh, digitising the newspapers, we also wanted to improve the um, reading room experience. Uh, so we refu refurbished our, our reading room in, at St Pancras uh, and opened a newsroom there. Um, and it effectively transformed the 19th century experience of Collindale into a 21st century um, news, news experience, so as well as being able to look at newspapers, you could look at broadcast news, radio, um, uh, and online material as well. We also had a bit of um, a resource left over, which allowed us to um, transform the reading room at Boston Spa, which, has, has anyone here ever used the reading room at Boston Spa, at the British Library? A few people, a handful of people. Um, it, I mean, until a few years ago, it was a fairly sort of antiquated experience. It was a little bit like stepping back in time. Um, it, it's now being refurbished. It's, you know, got access to all of our electronic resources. Um, and what's wonderful is where material has not been digitised, you can actually look at the print originals, which is terrific. Um, in the picture at the bottom there, um, that's at Boston Spa, I say about refurbishment, that might look a little bit antiquated in terms of the desk spaces, but they're some of the desks that we saved from Collindale, so some of the original antique desks that we got from the Collindale reading room. Um, uh, and it's quite nice to have that sort of that element of the traditions of Collindale continuing in a new setting. So just to give you a bit of an overview of the uh, materials that you can use at Boston Spa, print or microfilm newspapers. Generally speaking, if it's available on digital, that's the way that you will provide access to it, but we'll provide access to microfilm and print as well. Um, any of the online resources that we've got, um, Find My Past, lots of digital newspapers, um, and lots of other sort of family history related items, we've got a full list of those on our website. Um, 
And also our document supply collections. Um, I've, I've mentioned that Boston Spa was the hub of our interlibrary lending operation for many years. Um, it's really the equivalent of a, an absolutely first-rate university library research collection. So uh, if you're doing something like an open university degree or if you've got any relatives who are doing a degree themselves, it's an absolutely terrific resource um, uh, for them, particularly for those kinds of things which in their own university library might be, um, might be constantly booked out. And we also have access to the uh, legal deposit collection. So those materials, whether they're uh, journals, books, magazines, etc., which are de deposited with the library um, as part of legal deposits, they're available up in the Boston Spa reading room. If they come up from London, if they come up from uh, St Pancras, there's a 48-hour um, sort of booking period, but you would expect that for a truck making its way up the A1. <laughs> the items that we don't have available at Boston Spa are, are things what we call our special collections, so they're very much the ones that require a very high degree of curatorial care and um, oversight so original manuscripts, rare books, um, and our map collections, which, which you, you kind of would expect. It would be wonderful to have those sorts of materials up here, but that would be a very, very different operation from the one we have at the moment. Um, it's easy and uh, free to register. Um, so if you're interested in exploring the library's collections, if you're interested in registering for a reader pass, you can pre-register via our website. Um, and you can also order things as soon as you've, you've pre-registered. Uh, as long as you do that 48 hours in advance. And then when you come in um, to the Boston Spa site, we bring two forms of ID. One would be a proof of identity, like a passport, that type of thing. Another would be proof of address, like a utility bill. Uh, and you then get a read pass, which allows you to access the reading room at Boston Spa and use it for free as much as you want. Uh, the pass also applies to um, the reading rooms in London as well. So it's a really, it's, it's, it's a passport to an absolute wealth uh, of uh, uh, information and research resources. So really worth looking into if this is the kind of material that you're interested in looking at. Boston Spa, uh, or the Thor Parch Estate at any rate, um, it's not on any sort of main rail lines or anything like that, but there is a regular bus um, from uh, Weatherby. Um, through to the Boston Spa site. It's about five minutes off of the A1, um, so it's not too far from here, probably about 45 minutes drive um, up the road, and I think it's junction um, 46. Um, but, um, but quite easy to get to, um, and um, the site has got plenty of parking, and there is um, restaurant facilities there, so if you do want to come and make a day of it, you can get some lunch as well, and it's quite cheap, and it's very carbohydrate rich. So, <laughs> um, the site in London. Um, not not to forget that. If any of you are, are happen to be popping down to London at all uh, over the course of the next few months, do drop into the um, uh, 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 the uh, St Pancras site. It's only five minutes walk from Kings Cross Station. Um, we've got a free permanent exhibition, Treasures of the British Library, which has got items like Linda's Farm Gospels the Beatles manuscripts, um, and we've got, uh, as well as the James Cook exhibition which opens at the end of the month, we've got a free exhibition in our um, uh, entrance hall, um, which is about uh, recorded sound, um, as well as maps, newspapers, all the rest of it, we also have the National Sound Archive, so everything from oral history to pop music to wildlife sound recordings, um, so more than six million um, sound recordings, and a small array of those are uh, available to listen to and explore in the, um, in, in the uh, uh, front hall of the uh, uh, St Pancras site. Um, it's a very pleasant space, you can walk in and the public areas have got free Wi-Fi and plenty of desk space and, and lots of people I think go there and work there for months on end without going anywhere near the reading rooms because it's actually a very pleasant sort of office space in, in central London. Online is obviously very important as well, um, and um, there's a fantastic array of material. You can explore the collection via our main catalogue, which is Explore the British Library. Um, it, there's an absolute embarrassment of, of, of riches on the website. One thing that I would recommend very strongly is um, our Discovering Literature um, sites, which include themed collections on Victorians and Romantics, 20th century writers, medieval and Shakespeare. Um, and they're sort of wonderful um, sort of digitised versions of the original manuscripts as well as sort of explanatory um, essays and articles. Um, we've also got our collection of blogs. 
which the curators um, produce, um, and uh, effectively they give you a bit of a, a, a sort of like a, a, a view behind the scenes of the library, both in terms of the collections and in terms of the expertise that's required to look after them. Um, it's quite funny. The um, the uh, we have a sort of this on the on the on the right of the picture. We have a sort of list of the top ten most popular blogs, and uh, there's a quite a bit of competition between the curators of who can get the most hits. Um, usually, usually it's between our colleagues uh, in the medieval team, who obviously I mean they've got the most glorious, glorious array of illuminated manuscripts, which are absolutely gorgeous and, and very, very popular. Um, and our uh, uh, their bitter rivals in our Africa and Asia um, team, who simply have some wonderful, wonderful collection items. But it's a great way of opening up our, our collections to the public and explaining to people the sorts of um, material that's in them. Um, one of our most popular um, uh, stories were related to, um, in our medieval collections, uh, curators kept noticing that there were lots of depictions in manuscripts of knights fighting snails. Um, which sounds quite odd, but it kept coming up again and again, whether it was French, German, Flemish, manuscripts of a, a wide sort of range of time and wide range geographically, and no one really knew what this meant. Um, I mean, you, you assume that there weren't a race of giant snails in medieval times, um, but there was some sort of symbolic meaning to them, and because they sort of put this blog up, it went viral, it got tens of thousands of hits, and scholars from literally across the world were contributing their sort of theories of did it did it mean was it was it a metaphor for lust was it a metaphor for you know um, uh, sort of people from overseas it was it was a very sort of um, you know fascinating debate about sort of a, you know quite an obscure corner but it it shows just how sort of distant and strange the past can be as a place and what a fantastic way of bringing lots of expertise and uh, and, and and opinions together online can be. I mentioned about expertise. Um, white gloves is a, a classic example of that. Um, whenever we have a, um, uh, a documentary goes out with someone possibly handling uh, a British Library manuscript, we'll always brief our colleagues in customer services because they'll get lots of irate phone calls from people saying, why wasn't that person wearing gloves? Um, we have a policy um, that we, we don't wear gloves handling those kinds of manuscripts because uh, obviously it, they reduce the sensitivity. If you've got clean, dry hands, they're much more sensitive um, and, and you can turn the page with much more care. Um, so putting a blog about that and explaining it rather than sort of issuing a, a six-page PDF of collection care policy is a, <laughs> a much more approachable way of doing it and it's, it's a much more shareable way of doing it as well. Um, th this was an exchange on, on Twitter, um, uh, a programme uh, presented by Janina R Ramirez, a fantastic medieval historian. Um, someone commented about why weren't they wearing gloves, and, and she was able to link through to the blog. So rather than having to fight it out on Twitter, she was able to point towards the expertise and explain and help people to understand what we do. Um, so explaining to people a little bit more, making a bit more transparent what we do was a big part of the newspaper um, moves uh, uh, project and part of the, you know, as, as with any sort of major project, it did involve sort of withdrawing access to the newspapers for a period of time. So explaining through collection care blogs exactly why that was necessary, what the conservation challenges of looking after newspapers were, that was a fantastic way of doing that and, and involving people and taking them behind the scenes rather than just saying, you out of access to the newspapers for six months, you know, like it or lump it. So that's quite a sort of quick sort of uh, uh, tour of what the British Library is and what it does. Um, we are on social media in various different forms, um, uh, both the library in terms of its corporate feed, my team, the press office, and, and myself. Um, and um, very, very happy to take uh, any questions that you might have now. Thank you. Yes, please. Oh. Um, with the newspapers, quite a long time ago, if you looked online, you entered into a place, and then up came 
um, all the list of newspapers that sort of serve that particular area, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they lasted just for a few months or were long term. Mm -hmm. um, that seemed to disappear. I don't know whether it did disappear and has gone somewhere else, or, or whether it can be resurrected or, or what, but it's so useful. Even though now, uh, using the British Newspaper Archive online, uh, you're searching in a different way with perhaps a name or something else, mm -hmm. but knowing which newspapers and what years and everything else that cover that particular area was, was, was a very useful resource. Sure, okay. And w was that searching through the library's, the, the British Library yes, catalogue? Yes, it was. It was part of the British Library um, website. And I'm, I'm going, I'm definitely going back to pre, pre Collindale um, and Collindale Times. Hmm. Um, I would probably say that at least it was there probably eight years ago, at least, I think, that it was definitely there. And I've got some printouts for some time or other, which, you know, I sort of looked the, like what newspapers covered I liked, and I can remember there was a few that were just a few months. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I mean, and, and that kind of resource is really important, because, I mean, the, um, we, we had a newspapers creator, and he always used to joke that the history of newspapers is the history of failure, because so many of them would go bust very, very quickly. Um, I will look into that for you, if that's okay. If you want to come up to me at the end, and I'll find out if, if, if that list still exists, and I, I can tweet the results uh, and share that, share that with you, because obviously that kind of resource, um, which gives you a, a bird's eye view of, of what material is available, um, is tremendously useful. Can I, can I just add in there? Um, if you use the British Library's newspaper catalogue, um, when you put a place in, on the left hand side it will show the media and then you press show more and the, the title will come up of newspapers and you can still do what you're asking. But, but it's only the ones that they have already dealt, done? No, no, I'm talking about the British Library's own catalogue. You could, if you select it down to newspapers, it shall, will show you, you keep, you know, you delve a bit deeper and it will ex still show you which newspaper took over from which newspaper and, and which uh, survived for which however long, you know. That, yeah, on the British Library's <coughs> full catalogue, <coughs> not, not the newspaper catalogue, the British Library's. It's, yeah. Once you get the hang of it, it's very easy to use. Right, because I was looking at the, the bit that was... Not the digitised bit. The newspaper archive. The full <laughs> British Library catalogue. Narrow it down by category. Right, next question, please. Just a lady over here. Oh, sorry. Um, it, it's not a question, it, it's a comment on, on that. Uh, would it be referring back to the old news plan project where there were regional reports? And I think the one for Wales is still on the National Library of Wales site, but. Um, mm -hmm. The English re regions, it, they just might have, have disappeared because they've been sort of superseded in other ways. Um, but that was sort of pre the digitisation of the newspapers. It was sort of you know, <coughs> assessing which libraries held uh, which collections of newspapers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think I think the news plan resources are still available on the website somewhere. So usually on the individual um, lists from your own libraries, that um, if you go in via your library cards, they will often give you access to news plan, and then you can tell in that way what you can see. I, I have an ISSN number of my own, and I've been sending you copies of my family newsletter since 1983. Fantastic. I shouldn't think anyone's ever read them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any system to say what books or magazines are read? Uh, we, we do internally, yes, yes. I mean, that's an absolutely essential part for us of sort of like management information in terms of managing the collection, but also critically um, keeping track of it as well, so collection security. So. Um, that's that's something that we do do have um, in terms of sort of would you be sort of requesting 
out of interest, how many, you know, whether whether anyone had looked at it, that sort of thing. <laughs> I, 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 I can have a go at that. I'm not sure that's something that we sort of do generally. Cause, yeah, because we'd, we'd probably be deluged with requests from people um, to, you know, how many people have looked at my book, you know, that sort of thing. Um, when I last went to the St Pancras um, run, we could only go to the Indian information uh, we couldn't get a card for the whole of the library. Right. Has that changed now? When, 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 did, you, when oh, did you go? A few years ago. W w would that be sort of five years or ten yeah, years? Or? Yeah, five. Yeah. No, I, mean, I always thought it was the same thing. That's why I've never gone back up there. But right. You just could read all the stuff from India. Yeah, I mean, the... Um, Access to the collections now is done on the basis of having a reader pass. So if you if you can get if you can apply for a reader pass ahead of your visit, then you'd be able to access the entire collection uh, that was available, and that would include the resources of the Asia and Africa um, reading room, which would probably cover that material as well. Thank you. Um, two, two questions, if I may be very sure. On your slide earlier, you said that the British Newspaper Archive collection was free to use on site at Boston Spa. That's correct, yeah. Um, and I have been in the past a regular user at St Pancras. Does the free to use, how do uh, copies go on when you're using the free to use at Boston Spa for the newspaper archive? Are you able to, A, have printed copies, um, have a USB stick, or take pictures of the screen, or what? Um, you're not allowed to take pictures of, of the electronic resources, um, but I think you are allowed a, a lim limited number to, to print off, certainly. Is that because they're something like Sage Collection, or they're, you know, they're a third-party digitizer? Yes, yeah, I mean, bas basically, and, and indeed for, for any of our sort of subscription um, databases, you know, we, we do allow some photography of the physical items in the reading room if you've got, if you've got access to those and that's for research purposes. Um, but for the, um, the newspaper archive, um, it's, I think there's a limited number of print up, printouts, but you're not allowed to take pictures of the screen now. Right, okay. And following on from the lady who asked about the India Office records, mm -hmm. um, can one request, which I used to use copiously at um, St Pancras, can um, one request those for uh, use at Boston Spa? Not, not the under office material. That's that's available exclusively at at, in Pankers. the Asia and Africa reading oh, room. Okay. Yeah, that's right. right. Thank you. Um, I found one set of um, documents that you don't appear to have at the British Library, and those are theses prepared by non-PhD students. There, you have to go to the respective uh, university libraries to see those. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, can you explain why the British Library at Boston Spa isn't at Boston Spa? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, <laughs> to, to address to address that one first. Um, it's it was basically to do with postal addresses, um, and we were effectively getting the, the, the post for Boston Spa. Um, when we were the lending library, we were getting several van loads um, per day. So Thorpe Arch Trading Estate, such as it was, such as it later developed, wasn't that location at that particular point. So Boston Spa Post Office was effectively the official address that we received them. And because that became almost the sort of the worldwide identity of the British li lending library, Boston Spa sort of persisted as, as the name, even though as you say, it's nothing. It's nowhere near Boston Spa, which is a very pretty and charming little village, um, and, and and nothing like the kind of grey um, uh, sort of buildings that we have at, uh, at 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 our site. You know, which which is much more properly. You know, most people in the local area would say, oh, it's the Thorpe Arch Estate, but Boston Spa persisted as the uh, as, as as the name of it. Um, with regards to theses, um, we are you familiar with our um, ethos resource? Yes. 
Yes, yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's something that we've been working on um, for some time. We've got several hundred thousand available now. With regards to um, non-university theses, that's, that's not a subject area with which I'm tremendously familiar, but I do, I do have a colleague who specialises um, in sort of uh, theses in particular, and I'll be able to find out from her if that's OK. Um, yes, it's a dog. Um, you can get a good bus from Leeds to uh, Boston Spa, and the bus stops right outside your building. <laughs> the other thing is, I, um, I once met somebody who worked at the India Office Library, this is many years ago, and he was saying about new, they got newspapers from India. Do you still get newspapers from India? Uh, not on the scale that we did do back in the day. Yeah. Um, obviously, there was a, a, a period when large parts of the collection were coming from the empire mm -hmm. as well, effectively. Um, and lots of that sort of started to dry up around the time of decolonisation and lots of the countries gaining independence. It does mean, however, that we've got some fantastic collections from Ireland. And we've probably got better collections of newspaper from Ireland than they do in Ireland um, because so much material was destroyed during 1916. Um, and uh, we've got large collections, South Africa, India, as you mentioned, um, we've got some fantastic collections from Canada as well. So they, they tend to be very much weighted towards pre-1945 there, but some terrific collections. Any more questions? I, I, I've got one. Is it true that the search facility on the British Newspaper Archive site and Find My Past are different? The search operation is, that's why you should use the British Newspaper Archive first, but the content shouldn't be. The of course. Good. Yes. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in fairness, the British Newspaper Archive, we did work with Find My Past on that, so there's probably quite a bit more curatorial input into that in terms of how the search was organised. Um, I can't comment on the rest of the Find My Past site. Because Find My Past is obviously set up for family historians, it's name orientated, where the British newspaper search engine is, is academically orientated, if you want to say that. Um, so. I think he's on one of our communication channels that somebody said it's easier to search on the British because you've got an advanced search box which you don't have in the same way on Find My Past. Question at the front, please. Well, we used to buy vouchers to have photocopies of scientific papers. Mm -hmm. I imagine that's been phased out. What, what would you offer people now? Research people who want to get an obscure paper that... Uh, you've got access to in, in the library, and can they still get access to it online or something? Or? It, would, it would very much depend. I mean, would, would you be talking about accessing it through your own library from the British well, Library? I, mean, I, or? I, I was a research chemist, and I wanted to, uh, to, to, to actually find out what somebody else had been working on in another country. Mm. They published it, that you might well be holding copies of, of their uh, journals. Because uh, I actually had a collection of, of vouchers which mm. uh, I purchased in advance, and then I would just write on the voucher the, the, the article I wanted to, to look at, send it off, and back, mm. back came a, a photocopy. You, you can actually do that now through our, we've got a, a function called British Library on Demand, oh, and right. it's now it's back now a way of, I mean, it's primarily oriented towards institutions and HE bodies and that sort of thing, but individuals can use it as well, and, and that will get you a P PDF. Yes. Um, uh, document the, of the of the article that you're after. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I again thank Ben very much indeed for coming? Can I also give a plug for the restaurant? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is excellent. Good. <laughs> very good. <laughs> well worth the trip. If you get a group together, they will arrange a tour for you to go into the, not the British newspaper building, but the other low uh, oxygen storage. 
Uh, and the little fact that Ben didn't mention is that these cranes move about 35 miles an hour, don't they, some of them? Yes. Yeah. Which is quite James Bond um, when you're watching this fly about. Uh, another plug for the ethos, which I hope some of you already know about the ethos, being able to use the doctoral thesis, um, which you, do, you just need a free account. So, um, you know, if you're researching your names quite a long way back, somebody may have done a, a very intense study mm -hmm. of a certain place, uh, that, and that is a brilliant resource. Um, I think, was it Susan Major we had at, when we had at York? Or I think that was actually a different event. But her newspaper excursions um, work is in there, which is great for, for all our, our ancestors that went on these massive trains. Yeah. So can I once again ask you to thank Ben for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And just, sorry, just to let you know as well, Jackie very kindly um, handed out some of the leaflets relating to Boston Spa. If you would like multiple copies of those to take back to groups, that sort of thing, I do have a, a, a set of spares here, so you'd be very welcome to take a handful with you. And, and go and visit. Use the resources. It'll be quieter. The less, there'll be less people sleeping uh, in corners than there are <laughs> often in London. Um, right, we are drawing to the end of our uh, conference um, nicely, just ahead of time. Um, before I hand over to our president, I'd like to thank all our speakers. I'd like to thank the hotel for looking after us very well. I'd like to think, thank uh, Feature Media for filming. Um, Bob Cumberbatch will be helping with the editing and according to the speaker's requirements, some will be um, within the members' room, others will be public, so the one for the British Library will be a public one, uh, and we'd ask you to disseminate that, why not? I'd like to thank David Burgess in particular, um, my co-organiser as well as Paul Featherstone, but David has done an excellent uh, number crunching for costings, for who should be where, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So could we just acknowledge David's work? Of course, <laughs> when we're talking about number crunching and logistics, we mustn't miss out uh, Alan Morehouse. <laughs> Or his patience with us all. Um, and anybody else um, from whatever element of the guild? Yes, there's uh, one person you've missed out, and that's Jackie DePell. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to welcome you all to Yorkshire. I hope to see you soon. We are in forecasting in Seb Sub. Uh, a Where's Rod, our Secretary of SEMSUB? When's our next Yorkshire seminar forecasted for? Can you remember? Uh, yeah. Next year? Mm. No, I can't either, but it, we, we do plan to be back um, <laughs> in Yorkshire. Um, so feedback forms, we sell multiple times. Um, pick up the rest of the leaflets, have a little look. Um, at what's there, lanyards in the bag, and I just would like to thank everybody that's had anything to do with whatsoever with the Guild and the conference, etc. We are a fantastic team of volunteers and we all do all sorts of things. And we didn't have a membership, and then attendees, whether you're a member or not, wouldn't be worth doing, would it? We wouldn't be uh, any reason to exist. So give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> So I'll hand over to our president um, in good time to close our conference, please. Thank you very much. I was actually going to suggest that uh, we thank all everybody and so on. I, I really would like to thank you all for coming and giving us this, this, this sort of support. And I must say that the little conversations one has over meals with somebody said, well, oh yes, well, I, I didn't use the, that sort of record. What can you get out of that? Now, those sorts of conversations are very, very helpful indeed. And, you know, that sort of proves the, the, uh, the, uh, the idea that conferences like this are very, very useful. 
Anyway, I think uh, everybody else has had their share of thanks very much, so thanks very much to everybody. I now declare this conference closed. Thank you. <laughs>